Hi, everyone. Welcome back to a National Entrepreneurship Week 2023's Everyday Entrepreneur Speaker Series. Um, I think we have not had a single everyday entrepreneur. We've had exceptional entrepreneurs, and that is no different today. I am so excited to be here today with Sita of Puff Cuff. So, Sita, you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to... Um, going to go over Sita's impressive bio, and you all will definitely understand why I, I say exceptional entrepreneur, and then we'll kind of dive into your journey and um, your experiences with entrepreneurship. So Sita is the inventor, founder, and co-CEO of Puff Cuff. She holds four U.S. patents for a natural hair item, making her the first and only African-American woman to do so. Sita is an expert graphic designer who worked for 25 years as a solopreneur until launching Puff Cup in 2013. Sita is in charge of the company's overall strategy, product development, and brand management, which results in compelling content and strong brand recognition. In 2018, she was awarded the President's Innovation Award by Sally Beauty, and in 2020, the New Voices Barefoot Wine hashtag We Stand For Her Beauty Business Grant. She's a 2021 graduate of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses National Cohort and a growth coach for the Goldman Sachs 10 Million Black Women Black in Business Program. I'm so excited to dive into this. Let's just start by uh, what is Puff Cuff? Let's start with that. Okay, so I'm going to reach and get it because yeah. I have it in my hair, but I'm not trying to take it out. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the demo would be amazing. I might have to do that because... Okay, so this here, this is a puff cuff. This is actually the second from the largest. So the puff cuff is the only hair clamp specifically designed for those with thick curly textured hair that will not cause headache and will not cause hair damage. So what the puff cuff does, let me see. Let me see if I can get, I can kind of do it with the front of my hair. Okay. So you gather your hair first. You open the puff cuff wide, you clamp it around, and then you just let your hair go. So what it does is it takes the thickness and density of the hair works outwardly on the clip to keep it closed. So there's no cinching of the, the clamp on the hair, like rubber bands and bobby pins and everything, rubber bands and elastic bands especially, especially they cinch the hair down to the smallest point of resistance. Well, that works for straighter, finer textures, but for those of us with curl and bulk and thickness and density, naturally, all it does is hurt. And I believe, you know, even those with silkier, finer textures, we all equally hate the rubber band. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> right, right. So that's where the inspiration came from. And literally it was because I stopped chemically straightening my hair back in 2000 and oh, 2006. And at that time, there was no curly hair movement. There was no curly is, you know, there, curly is the way to go. There was no YouTube influencers. Insta, I think Instagram was just Insta at that point. It hadn't even grown up to Graham yet, but I did not know how to style the hair that was coming out of my head after I stopped chemically straightening it. And I stopped chemically straightening it because I just went longer between treatments and I had been suffering from dandruff, dermatitis. I can't even remember how long I had been suffering from it, but when I went longer between treatments, it all disappeared. Mm. And I was like, okay, my body has been waiting for me to stop this so it could exhale and be like, you don't need to do this anymore. So I listened. I was, it was so much of a relief because I was like on steroid creams, you know, steroid pills, all this, that, and the other to try and get it to go away. And I thought it was just a part of my makeup, not realizing it was something that I was doing to myself. And mm -hmm. I had been having, I'm going to take this, take this out right quick because it's just as easy to get out as it is to put in. Yeah. And then, you know, it doesn't, since it's not cinching, it doesn't ruin your hairstyle. It's just literally holding the hair in place. So um, what I was saying is I refused to go back to chemical, get, putting those chemicals on my body anymore. But at that time, 
like I said, there was no natural hair or curly hair movement. So there weren't any tools that would allow me to hold my hair up or style my hair in a way that I felt comfortable and wouldn't cause me to have a blazing headache by the end of the day. Yeah. I just feel like this is, this is an invention out of necessity, honestly. Like Total necessity, total yeah. necessity, total necessity and total, we call it, we're doing a, a campaign now that is hashtag beauty, beauty brainwashing. The fact that, you know, more majority of the tools out there in for styling hair are meant to be used with straight hair or they force you to straighten your hair in yeah. order to use them successfully. And that's a society thing, yeah. you know, on top of it. And I think, it and it's, and it's cross ethnicities and cross cultures. Mm-hmm. So now that we are, I say, we learn better, we do better. And most of us are, they're trying to live healthier lives in one way or another. Um, that's where Puff Cuff came from out of that necessity. I love that. And I know I am an avid TikToker and that natural hair, like the curly hair movement is, is just thriving. And I, and I'm so glad to see that. Um, so I, I do want to, you mentioned in your bio, just this really unique concept of the solopreneur and kind of that really, I would imagine contributed to your role at Puff Cuff and kind of what you're doing in terms of that. So can you talk a little bit about just your overall experience and journey and entrepreneurship, even before Puff Cup? I think I was born an entrepreneur. I mean, to tell you the truth, yeah, I've been having some type of a side hustle since I was a little kid. Even when I think my, my dad, my, both of my parents were entrepreneurs. Um, I'm not going to say that they were successful entrepreneurs, but they were small business owners. I started painting, hand painting, um, business signage when I was, I think, nine, 10 years old. And I was doing that for different law offices and dental offices at at that time. And I always knew I wanted to, I had a creative mind, didn't know that I could actually make a create a career out of this creative mind. So I went to college originally for business. And after I got finished, after I, my first year of failing all of my business classes, I cha- secretly changed my major to visual communications. And since then, it was, you know, just the world opened up and my, the options for graphic designers actually being able to feed and take care of themselves. That's where it came from. Um, and then I also, I worked full time two years out of college and realized, you know what? I could do this myself and be my own boss and not have to deal with the other things that come with corporate life. And I work well with others, but I work better solo. So mm-hmm. owned owned my, you know, my my weaknesses and strengths. And from then I was always a freelancer or a consultant of some kind. So that really helped me with being able to transition into what I'm doing now. But to be honest with you, I never thought Puff Cuff was going to be what it is now. Okay. Does that that mean, you know, I really thought I was, I'm one of those people, my sister and and my mom, and we always did craft shows and, you know, we did canning and I decorated like spoons and stuff. So being that independent person with always a side hustle was my thing. And that's what I always wanted to do. I never wanted to work. I never desired to work in corporate. If I did, I would be a freelancer or a consultant, but that would, that made it less scary to transition into small business ownership. But like I said, to be honest, I never thought, I thought I was going to be selling these things at craft shows to tell you, to to tell you the truth. I never thought it was going to be a a business um, that I could say, you know, has reached 2 million in sales in 2020. So this is, this is, this is a very, ever evolving journey. Yeah. I love that you kind of have always had a creative entrepreneur spirit. Like whenever we talk about young kids that have this just inherent entrepreneurship, we often think like lemonade stand, you're, you're out here painting signs. Like that is, you are (laughs) creative from the very get go. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of, we, we like to start with challenges and failures, but we don't call them failures. They're all learning opportunities, but as you were starting either as a solo, any, any 
part of your entrepreneurial journey, kind of what are the obstacles that you faced and how did you go about overcoming them? Always, okay. I think coming from a brown person's perspective, I didn't even know what capital was. Sure. I just thought that you just started a business and you started from nothing and you grow to something. So my nothing was literally nothing, <laughs> not, you know, a little amount of money that a, a relative gave or my parents sold a house and gave me, no, no, it was literally zero. <laughs> zero. Okay. So, but I also have to say that I didn't know what I didn't know. If I had have known a lot of what I know now, I probably would have talked myself out of it. But I was blessed enough to be that, that, that have that naivety that did not, that helped me, um, didn't, um, what do you call it? Didn't, oh, what is the word? Dang. It didn't make you shy away from it. Like right, it didn't make it, shy, it didn't intimidate me. So, right, it didn't intimidate me. So I just went ahead and did one moment at a time, one, one issue at a time, one whatever as a time. Now looking back, I'm like, dang, how did you get past all of that <laughs> to get to where you are now? But I still have some of the same struggles. But I would say definitely capital is one. Capital is huge. Um, working capital, that's what it is. Basically, we've bootstrapped from day one and the business is going to be, Puff Cuff will be 10 years old this mm -hmm. August. And we're still right now in the midst of, okay, we're running out of cash, but it's not been the first time we've been low on cash. You know Correct. what I mean? Yeah. And now I know, I know what I know now, how to remedy that pro that issue where before it was, I, it was, okay, how do I do this? Where do I go? What I, and then also not having that big of a network hmm. that was huge in the beginning too. I didn't know, I didn't realize that you can't work in a silo. You can't be an island of one until the end of 2019 into the beginning of 2020. Okay. I believe that even this right now has come from, I made a promise to myself in 20 at the end, at, at that, during that time period that I needed to build my network. Sure. I needed my name and my company's name in the mouths of people that were in conversations that could make a difference or in conversations that I couldn't be in. So that's where Goldman Sachs actually came from. That was, I was like any cohort incubator, accelerator, whatever you want to call them that came across my email I'm in there, <laughs> I'm in it, I'm applying, I'm doing it. So it, it, it worked, it, it, but there's also a trade-off. I'm not a solopreneur, but I am the leader of the company. And I'm only one person. So I had to take my eyes off what the inner workings were happening inside to be able to build. I hate the word personal brand. I That's so, what is it? A little overused, but it's great. <laughs> I, right, I can't stand that. But I had to, I understand, I can't stand the word of it, but I understand. I'm not building my personal brand. I'm building my network. Sure. And um that has made it to, okay, now, like I said, we're low on cash, but now I have people within my atmosphere that I can either reach out to, to say, this is the problem I'm having. Who do you know? Who do I need to talk to? What needs to happen next? And they also, I'm building those relationships where two years ago, if I had been in the same problem, the same issue, was that two years ago? Is that 2022 is that two years that's 20, yeah 2020 it's 2023 yeah. so yeah yeah okay, three years ago I would have been like probably over there in the corner in a puddle of my own tears trying to figure out what what to do yeah so, yeah I think you speak to really tangible barriers that we hear across the board like access to capital is huge and just a lack of social capital to connect if you had to give like one piece of starting advice for a prospective entrepreneur entrepreneur on both of those barriers like what would be the starting point that you took with those two just a quick it doesn't have to be like pursuing venture right it can be something very small that you can start with what would you recommend there's a lot of 
there's a lot more opportunities that came out that came out for people of color after the whole George Floyd thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a total shame that that's what had to happen, but there's more opportunities now. Take advantage of those opportunities. There are, do your due diligence. There's grants out there. There's free money out there, but just know that free money helps you get started. It doesn't help you grow. Mm. Mm. So go in, I, going, go in eyes wide open. And I think a lot of people that look like me are, and I say this because I'm, I'm, I'm me and this is my perspective. Sure. Um, we don't, we don't come from a line of people who have led successful businesses. We come from a line of people who have started in business out of necessity or they were forced to because they could not gain gainful employment someplace else. Mm -hmm. And we then why I say like my parents weren't successful business owners because successful business owners, they sell their businesses to move on to something else. People that are usually that I'm familiar with they just died at the business. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? There was no legacy. There was no generational wealth. There was no leaving this for someone else to pick up the reins and move forward with it. So the family or the money continues to grow. It's just, this is what I'm doing to survive. Mm -hmm. I didn't know until recently that that was even a thing that, pe that a black or a brown person like me can sell a business and keep it moving. We only have so many examples of those within our close, you know, our close atmosphere. So a lot of, there's no one that you can really go to, to say, this is what you do. This is how you do it. This is all money's not good money, you know, things like that. You don't, but that, that's one of my, that's my mission and passion after Puff Cuff. The goal is to sell Puff Cuff. No lie. That is the goal within so many years. And I want to be that person for those people, whether they look, whether they're black, white, blue, green, male, female, or whatever, that do not have that person or that, that source of reality that, hey, you're not getting a loan because you're a female. You're not getting a loan because you're a black female. That's okay. Someone eventually will say yes, but you're probably going to get more no's than you are going to get yes, but it's not you. Yeah. It's not you. It's who you are in the society. It's who you were, you were born as, but the society that we live in. Yes. 100%. This is such a powerful conversation. And the idea that entrepreneurship is a necessity for many folks, but they don't have that opportunity to learn how to make it an option. Yes. I feel like you're speaking so much to many of the underserved populations we try to reach with national entrepreneurship week. So thank you for, for that. Um, relatedly, we always talk about like the biggest challenges. I feel like you've had so many successes, including I've got to talk about the patents because you are really just setting, setting a, a standard for, and in being the first African-American to hold an African-American woman to hold for as patents for a natural hair item is incredible. And that system itself, patents, copyright is often very intimidating. So could you talk a little bit about that process what that looked like, what your experience was with that, with that piece of Puff Cuff. I'll have to say that that was again, um, a blessing of my network. So, I, yeah, I took, I worked at a junior college when I first had prior. Okay. I had the idea. I was freelancing at a junior college at the time, um, had some significant life changes happen that gave me enough courage to say, okay, I cannot continue to let this idea just sit on, sit on the shelf. I've got to make this happen. I was blessed to be working with the same woman who hired me for my first job out of college. <laughs> I was working with her at a um, community college. I went to her and I was like, I need a full-time job because I've got to have some type of consistent income in order to fund my idea. So with that, being at a community college, at that time, which it still is now, I guess, um, you had mostly adjunct professors. So they were professionals by day, professors at night. Mm -hmm. I had this idea. I had drawn it out on paper, knew exactly in my mind how it should look and how it should function, but had no idea how to get it from off of a piece of paper to an actual working piece of 
you know, a worse, a working product or a prototype. Um, I networked. That's when the catalog was actually a catalog. <laughs> there was no, <laughs> so I had to say I catalog stocked the, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, classes and what do you call it? class schedule booklet blah, yeah, blah, blah. yeah sure. and I literally email we did have email but the catalog was still a catalog <laughs> um I I it was inner office mail that's what it was called inner office mail <laughs> that's probably even before your time but I inner office mailed every single professor in the engineering program until somebody replied and said I would talk to you because I'm like I have an idea I, I don't know how to get to the next step mm -hmm. to speed it up Someone met with me. He was, I remember his face, don't remember his name, but I remember his face big as, you know, clear as day. He turned, he went into his network and connected me with a CAD engineer. Within that, with that CAD engineer, he introduced me to my injection molder, who happened to be another adjunct professor. With my adjunct, with my injection molder, he went into his network. And he connected me to my patent lawyer, who is my patent lawyer to this day. And I say that, again, I didn't know what I didn't know. So yeah. I didn't know what patents cost. I was fortunate to, enough to be connected to a patent lawyer that was not an opportunist. He was a, and still is a firm believer in um small business and being a champion for small businesses and small business owners. So I, I would say my journey through, through patent ownership is not typical. It was more of a blessing because I didn't get, I was not connected to people who knew that they could charge me out the wazoo, but they didn't. So every one of my patents has been through him and it's been a very smooth journey and it did not break the bank. Mm. That's, I mean, that's incredible. And I think that that, I love how you kind of articulated that the network expanded because the network expanded. Like it, I think people think sometimes they have to build their network on their own, but you build a connection and they build the connection. And it's just kind of this like growing piece right. of how to engage properly with the ecosystem. And I also love that you started with your community colleges. We're big advocates for like, oh, in every I tell everybody start there, start at the community college. My first, I went to the SBDC. There's the, they're the ones uh, that helped me um, write my first business plan. They actually connected me to my first, um, my, the first organization that gave me a loan, which is still around now is Axion. They uh, connected me and I got my first loan um, for $16,000 <laughs> to build my first mold. So, and, and I always say, if you're starting this journey, there is a lot of stuff out. Don't pay for anything. Mm. Don't pay for the education between SBA, SCORE, SBDC, your community. All, there's so many resources out there, but I can tell you, if you don't ask, you don't get that's 100%. Like we, our Wednesday program every year is federal entrepreneurship day because of just the immense amount of resources that are untapped because people don't know about them and oh, no. mm -hmm. need to engage. I mean, if, like you said, if you ask, you will receive. Yeah. Uh, and I love, I love that you <laughs> mentioned like these tangible ways that people can get engaged from the start, like SBDC community colleges, your local score um, mentors, there are very easy opportunities if you even just have an idea to bounce it off of somebody. So that is such a good, such a good piece of advice. Um, we got to talk about the Goldman Sachs program because I think I heard you say that you went into that program with an established business. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of people think of incubators in these type of programs is like, I come in with this potential business. So I want you to talk a little bit about that experience, what it was like to go through a cohort type program and kind of what what you learned through that so my uh my coach has asked me to stop saying the word so but I say so a lot <laughs> I say just I always hear like you're not supposed to say just because it's apologetic I get it <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it's it's right there but I don't hear it till it's already out but anyway <laughs> um when you when you're so far into being a small business owner and entrepreneur, 
you're it's on the job training, right? Mm -hmm. And Goldman was, it came along at a time where I had exhausted all of the free stuff. And there's a point where, yeah, if you're a budding entrepreneur, if you have an idea, to, there's plenty of stuff that you can go and learn from the basic, you know, to get the fundamentals and the basics of how to start a business. But when you're, I wouldn't call myself seasoned, but when you're past that stage, there's limited availability of someone of, of, of programs that teach you how to get to the next step, teach you how to scale, teach you the fundamentals of what you need to know in order to scale, what your numbers say, all of that. Because a lot of times you are so working in the business, you're not working on the business. Mm -hmm. So it got to the point where I needed to work on the business. And like I said, I needed to work on the business and I needed to grow my network. So when Goldman came, came, that opportunity came along, I had been hearing about it. And then a couple other entrepreneur friends, um, I'll say acquaintances, had also taken the program. And it was always, oh my God, if you get in, you got to take it. You got, it's, it, it's such a benefit. And this, it, it, it did so much more for my mindset and my business. And the, so when I got that opportunity and I was accepted into the program, I was, you know, super hyped about it, but had no clue what I was getting. <laughs> getting sure, <it>. yeah. <laughs> I was one of those people that when I graduated college, I felt like I escaped. Like I was like never going back. <laughs> and then you just and you willingly applied. To right, the willingly applied. <laughs> willingly applied. Not only willingly applied, I got three kids, a husband and three dogs. It, and they told, they were very, very, you know, up front that this is going to take all of you. You're going to have to spend so many hours a week doing this. You need somebody to kind of step into your role because you're going to be missing because you're going to have to do, you know, the curriculum and this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And me, the pessimist I am, I was like, Shh, I've, I've done, I've built this business so far. I'll be okay. I was having nightmares by the time it's done. I had, when I, at the end of college, I had this reoccurring nightmare that I um, forgot to take a class mm -hmm. and they were like, I registered for it. I knew it, but I never attended class and it came down to graduation and they were like, you know, you didn't, you know, you didn't finish this class and they wouldn't let me graduate. I started having that nightmare again within Goldman Sachs. And it wasn't because the curriculum was so hard. It was very, very demanding on your time. Mm. I would not trade it for the world. Gold, that Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business program catapulted everything. It, I, I was able to see very clearly what I didn't know about my business, even though I had been doing this for what, seven years at that point, mm -hmm. what I needed to know, the steps to in between to get to the next and that I wasn't alone. And they, they don't just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of noise out there, what people say they will do for you in terms of um, training and education and all, there's a lot of noise, mm -hmm. but no substance. Goldman is all substance. I was blessed enough, again, I'd say an opportunity. I went through the national cohort because there is no chapter in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Going through the national cohort was the most amazing process ever. And even now, this is, I was in 2021, I'm still getting opportunities to speak, to be in front of other entrepreneurs, to inspire because of Goldman mm -hmm. and I wouldn't trade it for the world. I almost like it was the, it was worth, what was that commercial priceless? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's priceless. amazing. 
yeah, we, I mean, Goldman Sachs is a huge supporter of National Entrepreneurship Week. It connected us to you and your story. And so we're very thankful for them and encourage folks to look for those types of opportunities. So I know we're approaching our time. We try to keep this tangible and mm -hmm. quick um, listen, but our final question what advice, if you had to give one piece of starting advice for an entrepreneur that's either just starting or they're aspiring to be an entrepreneur, what advice would you give them? <laughs> this has been my favorite question because every <laughs> I feel like every entrepreneur I've interviewed so far is like, man, like I have, like, it's hard to pinpoint it's one. It's hard to pick one. It's right. Yeah. It's hard to pick yeah. one. What I do, I have a it's mantra that I say, order the big plate, but take small bites and drink plenty of water to avoid acid reflux, which is a whole nother thing. <laughs> okay. Limit okay. your coffee too. But I'm saying that to say this, do not look, eventually you're going to look here but you got to start here. Mm -hmm. If you look here, you it's going to take your breath away and you won't, it will, especially if you don't come from that, but it'll take your breath away and it will make you, it will paralyze you. Some, you just have to think one, one step at a time. Sometimes I say one moment at a time and know that you're not alone. And, and don't know that you're not alone and, and, and speak what you need. People are out there to help you and guide you. And there are good people. There may be hard to find and anybody that charges you run fast, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, don't, don't work. Like I said, don't work in that silo, mm -hmm. but also keep things in perspective. I always tell people, look, some people may think that, you know, Puff Cup is saving lives, but it's not. I know, <laughs> I know that the sun will rise tomorrow if something has to wait. Mm -hmm. And keeping it in perspective can be hard, but you have to. And it from the journey, from the whole, all of it, just keeping things in perspective and keeping it small. Just eventually, like you say, they can't eat an elephant in one bite. Don't try. Yeah, it would be silly. <laughs> right. Don't don't try. Don't even, you know. Yeah. Pace yourself. Take your time. Amazing. Small things. Yes. I feel like you managed to put like three different pieces of advice in my okay, one. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, am I rambling? But I think I did more than one. <laughs> no, I love it. I think it's such a powerful way to end. Where can they learn more about Puff Cuff um, and, and that product? If you put in Puff Cuff. In the Google, you will definitely find out. In the Google. <laughs> yes, in the Google. Uh, we are at thepuffcuff.com. Okay. We are at the Puff Cuff, T H E P U F F C U F F, on every single social media channel. Um, the real C to E is me on Instagram. But one thing I can say is my brand is my brand is built on a lot of social proof. I wanted puff cuff to represent the people who use it mm -hmm. I didn't want to create a false image um I think people want to see that's why I love Lizzo it's like I love Lizzo but at the same time it's like I I understand her her journey mm -hmm. of not trying to be phony about this mm -hmm. you know, nothing is I want my my customers to see themselves and I kind of position myself as to be one of the girls and so I don't know if that, that's probably I think a little that bit more. That authenticity yeah. matters. Yeah, yeah, that, that authenticity matters. Right. Yep. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome, Sita. And I'm so excited to share your story. Um, and we'll just continue to stay in touch. Consider us part of your network now. So. Yes, yes. Awesome. Okay. Ditto. <laughs>